everyone. Welcome to CCG 7th edition of Annual China and Globalization Forum. You're watching the forum's special program, The Future of the Multilateral Trading System in Changing Global Context, presented to you by the Center for China and Globalization. This dialogue is hosted by CCG President Dr. Wang Huiyao. Dr. Wang, over to you. Thank you. Good evening and uh, good morning, uh, and also good afternoon. <laughs> Depends where you are. And uh, we have our guests, one in US, one in uh, Europe. And uh, so thank you for tuning in uh, for our uh, uh, audience uh, here in China and also uh, in other parts of the world. You are watching CCG Special Dialogue, which is uh, the multilateral trading system in global changing contest, live from CCG head office. Uh, this is actually a part of a seventh annual China and Globalization Forum. And this year, uh, CCG took the initiative to uh, organize the discussion on the recovery of a global economy, trade and mobility, uh, China EU economic cooperation, global cooperation and the China New Development Plan, and also China's international communication. And also we had a quite a bit of focus on uh, China-US relations uh, uh, on the webinar and also on the multilateral uh, trading system. So tonight, this forum is uh, really devoted to the multilateral trading system, but also globalization. Uh, so this forum actually achieved a great uh, 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 success. As a matter of fact, we, has, uh, we have more than 400,000, 400 <laughs> distinguished guests taking part, including nearly uh, 30 ambassadors, and over 50 senior diplomats, country heads of international trade groups and the chambers and the multinationals represented from international organizations, uh, nonprofit and, and, and the government representatives, and also business leaders, scholars, and experts from academic and think tank communities. So it's quite a, a, a well uh, uh, annual uh, forum that the CCG organized. We're very pleased to organize this uh, concluding webinar, which is uh, uh, one of the uh, very important webinar tonight. Uh, so, uh, we already had a two webinar in the last previous two days. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the first uh, uh, online webinar we had was uh, uh, John Fountain, he's the chair amateur of uh, book institutions and culture of Asia Society. And he is also Adam uh, Posen, president of Peterson Institute, and also Ambassador Steve Roy, the former US Ambassador of China, and also CCG advisor, the former Vice Minister Zhu Guangyao, uh, attended our first uh, Sino-US uh, uh, webinar. And then uh, yesterday we had a second webinar, which is uh, focused on also China-US relation. We had uh, uh, the, uh, the former acting uh, deputy secretary of the State Department for Asia, uh, Ms. Susan Sonten, but also uh, with uh, uh, the uh, Ronnie Chen, the, the, the chair of uh, Asia Society Hong Kong Center. So we are very pleased actually as the our final uh, 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 webinar tonight, we have actually thrilled to have two distinguished guests to explore the global trade and globalization with us. Um, so we have an uh, honor to have invited Pascal Ami and uh, uh, Wendy Cotter, also a, a, a good friend. Uh, I'd like to introduce Pascal Ami. Pascal Ami is the president of the Paris Peace Forum, which is a very a well-known, uh, well-established peace forum in Paris. It's running for, uh, uh, it's going to get into its fourth year now. And he's also a coordinator of a Jax Deleuze think tank, which includes Paris, Berlin, and Brussels. He was the longest serving WTO director general uh, so far in the history of WTO uh, from 2005 to 2013. And between 1999 and 2004, he was the EU trade commissioner. And also, he began his career in the French civil service at uh, Inspection General de France, the Finance, and also the Treasury. Then he became an advisor to the Finance Minister Jacques Delors, and subsequently to Prime Minister Pierre Marot. He served as a chief of staff to the EU President Jacques Delors between 1984 and 1999. So, so thank you. Uh, welcome. Uh, uh, Pascal. Pascal also come to CCG Beijing office uh, uh, quite a few times, and I remember as early as 2019, you presented a, a speech at uh, CCG on WTO reform and the multilateral trading system, and many uh, 
CCG colleagues and uh, experts from uh, this field from China attended. And last year, you were also uh, spoke at the CCG six annual forum on China and globalization, and also you gave a very good uh, uh, congratulatory remarks for the CCG Global Young Leaders Dialogue, which launched in last uh, December. I would like also to introduce another well-known uh, speaker tonight. Uh, Ms. Wendy Carter is Vice President at Asia Society Institute, Asia Society Policy Institute, and also the Managing Director of its uh, Asia Society in Washington, DC office. And also in her own role, she focused on building SP's uh, presence in the nation's capital on leading initiatives that address challenges related to trade, investment, and innovation, as well as uh, women's empowerment as well in Asia. She joined SP following an impressive career of nearly three decades as a diplomat and a negotiator in office of US Trade Representative, USTR, where she also served as an acting deputy US Trade Representative. During her USTR career, she worked on a range of bilateral, regional, and multilateral trading negotiations and initiatives, including the US-Korea Free Trade Agreement, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP, US-China negotiations, and the WTO financial service negotiations. She has published a series of SP papers on Asia trade uh, and also many other global uh, multilateral trading issues. I also remember hosting uh, Wendy, actually, when you come to uh, CG uh, uh, in January 2018, which is uh, uh, quite a few years ago. And when, when, when CCG and SP jointly hosted the US China Economic Relations Roundtable uh, at that time. Uh, but also, uh, uh, again, uh, later that year, we actually uh, had joined your uh, a breakfast meeting at the Washington hosted by SB, and we had a, we had a very good discussion uh, between our two think tanks. I remember the, the meeting you, you, you hosted in Washington, we had many well-known US experts, including the uh, Catherine Chai, now the USTR, who also attended the, uh, the CCG and the SB event in DC. So uh, it's also, uh, you know, was mentioning that uh, back April last year, uh, both uh, uh, Wendy and Lamy uh, 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 participated in the CCG webinar, the role of a WTO global response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so a lot has, has actually <laughs> happened and a lot of us changed then. So, so let's begin our discussion today. And uh, so, so maybe I'll start with Wendy. I mean, uh, uh, since you, uh, uh, are very familiar with the uh, uh, US uh, government and you were former US government officials. Uh, particularly, you, uh, you, you look after ArcW2 and the multilateral trading system for, for quite a long time. So what are the, uh, are the US priorities for the, for the WTO reform and also the actually upcoming uh, 12th minister conference? Uh, perhaps you could uh, start uh, uh, and then we have Pascal to, to, to start us again. Well, thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank yeah, you very you much. It's really my honor to um, be here at another CCG forum, unfortunately virtual. I look forward to doing these in person again. And it's really, I'm humbled to share the virtual stage with Pascal and me with so much experience um, and expertise in this area, as well as you, Dr. Wang. So I'm looking forward to a, a very robust discussion. Um, I thought um, before I talk a little about how I think the Biden administration is viewing WTO reform is first just to highlight kind of three um, cornerstones of the Biden administration trade policy, because I think that will help us understand their view on the multilateral approach as well as on um, the upcoming um, WTO ministerial. First, the Biden administration trade policy is very integrated with its domestic agenda. And so issues like COVID recovery, um, climate change, build back better, all of these initiatives which are being pursued on a domestic basis are also being pursued on an international basis. Second, when it comes to trade policy, um, the new phrase in Washington is a worker-centric trade policy. 
I get a lot of questions on what that actually means. So let me um, share um, my um, sense with you, but I would be the first to admit, I think it's a work in progress and that how this policy kind of translates into concrete trade initiatives um, is still being developed. But what it, 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 the, the, the basis for this policy is really rethinking US trade policy as one that needs to change in order to benefit the working class, the middle class, um, be responsive to their concerns and priorities and use trade to really improve not only the number of jobs for US workers, um, but also to improve the quality of jobs. And again, not just US workers, but workers around the world and to really use trade, um, the phrase that Ambassador Tais use a lot, uses a lot is use trade as a force of good to really uplift the, um, the, the um, situation um, and livelihood of workers, um, as well as to promote um, more equality among, um, among workers, the middle class, et cetera. And the third kind of pillar of the Biden trade policy is to work with allies and partners. Um, we just launched, for example, um, a trade and technology council with the European Union, which um, for the purposes of today's discussion includes a working group on global trade challenges. But it also um, is um, centered on really um, being constructive and being engaged in, in international organizations, multilateral institutions, including the WTO. And so I think all three of these kind of pillars are relevant to, today, today's, to today's discussion. And when it comes to the WTO, we did see some early moves by the Biden administration to really show that they're back in the WTO including very quick endorsement of the new director general, not even waiting for the confirmation of Ambassador Tai. Um, but now we have a new director general at the helm. I'm sure we'll be talking more about Dr. Ngozi. Um, second, the United States has been very constructively engaged in the WTO agenda. Just last week, for example, we joined the um, the um, services domestic regulation plurilateral talks. Um, we have um, been active members of the fish subsidies negotiations. And of course, we are uh, joined ranks with others in calling for a TRIPS waiver um, for COVID purposes. So I think that gives some indication of how engaged and committed we are. Now that said, we still have not nominated nor confirmed an ambassador to Geneva, to the WTO. Um, and a lot of our, let's just say, kind of statements on WTO reform have yet to be translated into actual proposals that we put on the table. But I think that will happen in time. But I also think it's important that when we think about WTO reform and we think about the upcoming ministerial, this can't just be about the United States and what the United States is going to do. And are we conformed and are, are we committed and are we putting proposals on the table in order for the WTO to move forward and for the ministerial to be successful, this is gonna require contributions from all 164 members, as well as the major countries, um, major trading countries, including the European, Europe, Europe China and the United States. And with respect to China, um, I think that it's going to be important for China um, to kind of step up here and help move the WTO forward and update its rules. And in particular, um, I want to highlight the, the agenda in the WTO with respect to non-market economies. And I think this is an area looking forward where we will need to find a way to work together if the WTO is going to be continue to be relevant. Um, and I think there'll be a lot of interest in this agenda as we get closer to the 20th anniversary of China's accession to the WTO, which will take place later this year. 
Now, if I, I know I've been talking for a long time. Let me just make a few comments then on the MC12, the ministerial conference coming up starting November 30th in Geneva. This will be the first ministerial, if I'm correct, for the WTO in four years. It will be the first ministerial that will be led by the new um, Director General Ngozi. Um, and it's gonna be a challenge um, given where we are with COVID now, particularly if in-person meetings cannot take place in the lead up to the ministerial, and if the ministerial is not an in-person event or a hybrid event, because I think as we all know, for concrete outcomes to come out of WTO meetings, in-person meetings, side conversations, um, talks between smaller groups of countries are really essential. And no matter how great um, our virtual platforms are, um, they are limited with respect to be, in my view, to be able to really negotiate the final issues which allow um, you know, actual successful negotiations to reach their conclusion. The United States has been, I think, very cautious yet realistic about its objectives for the ministerial meeting. I think partially taking in, into account where we are with COVID now and the possibility of in-person meetings. But I also think it's important that we don't set high <clears throat> expectations and then don't meet them. <clears throat> I think it would, it's not in the WTO's interest for any headline around this ministerial to use the word fail or you know, not to have lived up to where it needs to be. And so I think that's why the United States has kind of put forward what it calls a targeted approach calling for a successful conclusion to the fishery subsidies negotiations, um, but also calling for some kind of modest institutional reforms with respect to transparency, to dealing with the, the, the self-declaration um, LDC issue, developing country issue, um, and other, in, other um, institutional reforms. Um, so let me stop there. I think there's a lot more to talk about, but um, hopefully I've touched some of the issues that will be subject to our conversation this, this evening. Okay, okay, great. <clears throat> Thank, thanks, Wendy. I, I think you, you have uh, highlighted, of course, the importance of WTO. I think that uh, I'm uh, very glad to see that uh, uh, Biden administration is now uh, uh, back to WTO, uh, which you have uh, illustrated. <laughs> and uh, um, uh, also a, a quick approval of DJ uh, uh, since uh, Biden took office. And uh, also uh, we see the DJ uh, has uh, also appointed uh, uh, four deputy uh, DJ, and then uh, we have one from US, one from China, one from EU, and uh, so, so it's quite well represented now. I, I agree that uh, we, we should uh, really focus on, on, on the future of the WTO because I think it's pandemic is really uh, we need uh, uh, a world trade to, uh, to reboot the global economy, particularly uh, given the history, uh, you know, in the previous time, the uh, uh, Second World War, or all those financial crises, we need always international trade has been a big boost uh, to the stability and global economy growth. So, so Pascal, you, you, you are the guru on <laughs> WTO, you, you, you are the longest serving uh, WTO DJ, and you know, EU, China, and EU also uh, a strong support uh, of the multilateral system. I mean, US as Trump has, uh, has backed off for a while, uh, uh, hopefully now Biden's coming again, but EU has been always there. China is also a strong support of the multilateral system uh, now also. Uh, so, so what's your uh, uh, assessment? Uh, I mean, also uh, can all the major players uh, play some more roles to to shape the, the, the revival of the WTO to, to gain the confidence. I mean, after uh, 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 you know, Doha round, we haven't really uh, you know, achieved anything. So uh, what's your uh, uh, take on this? I mean, your opinion obviously is widely <laughs> watched and also that impact on the globalization and, and also recovery of global economy. Okay, I'll try to answer your question, uh, Henry. Uh, and uh, let me also thank you for invited me together with uh, Wendy for this uh, conversation. Uh, short term, I think the main issue for us all uh, remains 
to exit uh, this uh, pandemic, uh, sanitary-wise, uh, economy-wise, uh, policy-wise, and this is not mostly a trade issue, although, although open trade and boosting trade uh, can help a lot uh, to uh, boost uh, the necessary recovery. There are a few issues that have to do uh, with uh, vaccine uh, production, uh, intellectual property, vaccine distribution, but this is not central to the multilateral trading system. If we look back at the sort of a big uh, copy view, why do we need a multilateral trading system? Why do we need a world trade organization? Uh, basically, uh, to uh, reduce obstacle to trade. Uh, in so far as we believe, and a lot of us believe this, that uh, opening trade is a good thing overall, hence reducing obstacle to trade that prevent trade to be more open is what needs to be done generally. Now, this is uh, the big principle which necessitates immediately a bit of a qualification, uh, which is why I totally agree with what Wendy said uh, about uh, the US trade policy or the EU trade policy or the China trade policy uh, being very much a domestic issue. And the reason why it is a domestic issue is that if opening trade works overall to create efficiencies, if the sum of wins and losers is positive globally, because efficiencies are higher, hence growth higher, this is usually not true locally. And the question of what is the real impact uh, in a country of trade opening on profession X, worker Y, consumer Z is something which is much more complex than the big picture. In other words, while opening trade is a global issue and hence necessitates a multilateral trading system, a lot of attention has to be taken locally in how you manage the distribution between winners and losers. Winners can be much more many than losers globally, but this may not be true locally. And the reality is that in the West, there has been uh, for the last uh, 10 or 15 years, more debate about whether or not this winner-loser equation has been taken right. And this explains why trade policy is very much a domestic policy. I remember uh, when I was uh, DG of WTO asking a minister if she could do this or that. And the answer was, come on, you're asking me to negotiate with myself. And my answer was precisely, this is exactly what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to renegotiate with your own constituency, your mandate, so that you can move. So that's for the sort of general uh, introduction. Uh, the reality is that we have a relatively open world trading system that has worked for the last decades. Trade is more open today than it was 10 years ago, and 10 years ago, it was more open than 20 years ago, yet, yet, there remains a number of issues in terms of leveling the playing field, i.e. ensuring as much as possible a fair competition uh, between uh, producers so that the benefits of trade opening of competition can flow to the benefit of consumers. There are basically, in my view, now, in the world of today, which is quite different from the world of yesterday, uh, two major issues on the substance of what needs to be done multilaterally to level the playing field. 
One has to do uh, with uh, competition and another has to do with how you handle precaution. Competition is about ensuring that producers compete on a fair ground, i.e. without trade distortions, which classically are uh, quantitative restrictions, tariffs, and subsidies. Quantitative restrictions and tariffs are in today's world not a major issue. They've been dealt with in the past, whereas subsidies, and notably because of uh, where China is in the world economy, uh, remain a problem. And I think the main issue for the multilateral trading system and for the WTO, as far as leveling the playing field is concerned, is what uh, the Chinese leadership uh, calls competitive neutrality. The reality is that China is a different economic political organization than the rest of the world, which is organized around globally uh, liberal market capitalism, uh, the reality is that uh, China remains a communist country whose view is that holding 30% uh, of the production system in the hands of the party, of the state, is the right way to go. This is very different from the rest of the world, and it's probably more different now, at least for the last 10 years, than it had been uh, in the 10 previous years after uh, China uh, joined uh, the World Trade Organization. So competitive neutrality, how to ensure that competing on the Chinese domestic market and on the international market with state-owned enterprises who are state-owned because they need the state support to what the Chinese leadership uh, attributes uh, to the benefits of this vast state-owned sector is an issue which, of course, many other countries have now uh, to deal with. Uh, EU, US are probably more outspoken than others in the fact that they see this problem with competing with state-owned enterprises as an issue, and then that necessitates further adjustment of the rules of WTO as far as subsidization is concerned, but there are many other countries that have the same view. So as far as the purpose of organizing a, a level playing field fair system is concerned, I think the issue number one is to strengthen WTO rules on uh, state aid. This is not the only issue. Another one, uh, which is more recent, has to do with what I call precaution. Precaution is when you protect your people from risks, whereas protection is when you protect uh, your producers from foreign competition. Precaution is now raising. It's about environment, it's about health, it's about safety, it's about security, it's about privacy. And this leads to a more fragmented a more important part of regulation in the economy and a regulation that is more fragmented given that the way you protect your people from risk is very often uh, correlated uh, with ideology, with culture, with religion, with history. And this is, I think, a major issue for the future. So this is what I see as the two main issues plus and I'll finish this uh, introduction to our discussion with uh, an issue which is quite dear to my heart, uh, which uh, unfortunately, in my view, uh, does not get the level of attention which it should uh, from uh, uh, countries, uh, negotiations and trade negotiators, which is uh, the WTO itself as a process. I think uh, the way the organization works needs a lot more attention, needs a lot of reform, because contrary to less 
a priori, modern organization, the WTO has a machinery uh, to uh, legislate, regulate globally is not what it should be for a number of reasons, which I think needs to be addressed. I won't expand on that, uh, but I deeply believe that the machine room needs attention if we want the WTO to be able to be up to its task in uh, the future. Over to you, um, Henry. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you, uh, uh, Pasca. Yeah, I think both you uh, and Wendy has actually uh, you know, outlined the, uh, the, the, uh, your, your perspective on the WTO reform. And of course, also uh, uh, you, you mentioned about uh, the future uh, 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 you know, roles and uh, uh, the, the shape in the WTO. So, so, but also mentioned about China as well. I, I, I think that China actually, uh, we, had, we just had uh, uh, recently, uh, about last month, we organized the uh, event, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, discussing about China joining the WTO for the 20 anniversary, we had a, a formal China uh, WTO chief negotiator, Mr. Long, Minister Long Yong Tu, and also we had a, yeah. a former vice minister, uh, the DDJ of WTO, uh, Minister Yi Xiaodun, you know, many other experts came and to CCG talked about that. What, what I think actually, uh, you know, for the WTO, uh, uh, which are, of course, trade has been greatly uh, benefit China, but also the world, like China, since China joined WTO, China's uh, 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 export to the world has increased uh, seven times, but China's buy-in to the world has increased six times also, and even more so on, 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 a, on, a, on a service trade. So, so I think it's really a, 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 a you know, multi-party uh, uh, win situation, whereas uh, China's trade with developing countries has increased hugely, but also uh, that, uh, uh, you know, China has contributed to the one third of the global GDP growth now. So, so I think the the system. I, I agree with both of you said. You know, this this reform, uh, this uh, policy. It's it's also related with its, its domestic policy as well. China has been you know, uh, lifted eight hundred million people out of poverty and uh, uh, represented seventy percent of the cutting of the global poverty. Uh, Ten years ahead of the SDG agenda on poverty alleviation. So 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 it shows that. Uh, you know, the system probably in China also works for itself, like uh, uh, Pascal mentioned about uh, there's a SOE portion of that, but you know, for any disaster relief, uh, for uh, lifting poverty and all those, you know, the SOE has to be in front and has to deliver many social responsibilities. So, so I think, you know, this hybrid system uh, that China has uh, seems uh, working for itself. But of course, I think you raised a very good point about competitive neutrality I think that is also a concept that is being uh, widely discussed in China as well. I think there is, could be uh, room uh, for, for the future uh, 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 improvement, uh, uh, absolutely. I, I think that uh, also, uh, as Wendy knows well, that uh, China also shows a great desire to, uh, to join TPP, CPTPP now, <laughs> which in that, you know, Minister of Commerce has put forward the TPP or CPTPP agreement on Minister website. Here's the, here's the <laughs> objective, here's the standards that, uh, that we, we, we need to look forward uh, in the future. And then that's, uh, I'm sure Wendy, you have to design many of that as well. Uh, so, so, so I think this is really a great discussion that we're having here. Uh, but what I, what I want to uh, you know, raise another question is that uh, I remember last year when we had this uh, uh, CCG webinar on uh, multilateral trading system reform, both you uh, uh, attended and also including uh, uh, Alan Wolf, the, the, the then Deputy Director General of the WTO, and, and quite a few other experts from China. We mentioned about WTO reform. You know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lack of leadership. And last year was really very obvious, lack of leadership. But I think, uh, you know, EU, China, but now US is back. And, you know, since WTO, everything is on consensus. We need really strong leadership. So can, can really uh, China, EU, and, uh, and US, of course, uh, to take really a great uh, concerted efforts to, to really make WTO work. I mean, Wendy, you have uh, written, uh, written recently saying that maybe we could have a, a US, EU, China uh, forum on, 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 on the multilateral trade system. I, I think that is a great idea to pursue. But also, uh, last time when we were discussing that, uh, we were talking maybe Secretary Office of WTO should play, play more role. Uh, like like a WHO or many other like uh, organization where I think uh, where member state 
probably is too many and, and too many <laughs> rules that hard to make a decision. And, and also, thirdly, we really need some low in hand food to, to, to conclude. Like this fishery uh, subsidy dis discussion has been going on for, for so long, maybe it's high time we, we conclude on that. But also, uh, uh, like uh, some of, uh, of those low in hand food, like uh, uh, plastic emission to the ocean, uh, that WTO can do something. I remember I, I went to the WTO public reform in 2019. I gave a talk there on this. Uh, initiative, I think, you know, both EU and Chinese uh, WTO ambassador were there, uh, very supportive, uh, and uh, many other countries too. So maybe, uh, but also, uh, you know, digital economy, uh, uh, other, you know, labor, uh, trade uh, investment uh, uh, facilitation, liberalization uh, of the investment. So those new things, I think we could probably push forward. So I don't know, you know, uh, uh, Randy, maybe we can have a, a more uh, uh, further discussion on those issues that, uh, you, you, you can give your uh, opinion as well. Uh, Randy, please. Um, well, thank you. Maybe before I get your question, just a couple of comments. I mean, I couldn't agree more with Pascal and me that we really need to look at the WTO machinery and these institutional issues because they're so interrelated with the inability of the WTO to produce um, successful negotiating outcomes. And so, you know, the, the, uh, the, the approach that the WTO followed, um, you know, for its early years with respect to um, needing consensus to arrive at decisions, um, to, um, you know, focus on this MFN principle that all, benef that all benefits from a negotiation should be applicable to all members. Um, and the issue of, frankly, um, LDC self-selection I think all three of these issues are perhaps outdated now, and they seriously need to be looked at. And you know, Henry, you mentioned the the fish subsidies negotiation. Well, one of the major stumbling blocks in that negotiation, frankly, um, from the U.S. perspective at least, and I think Europe and others, is this whole issue of developing countries, including China wanting to be treated as developing countries and therefore not assume you know, full obligations. And so I just wanted to make the link between these institutional issues, which sound very kind of wonky. Um, they're so interrelated with where we see the WTO today. Um, so I think it's important that we look at these issues. And in my view, I think the only way forward is to allow for subsets of WTO members to meet, to negotiate, to um, agree on outcomes, to share the benefits just among those parties, but at the same time to invite other parties to join and to offer them the technical assistance that might be needed to get them to be in a place where they can um, participate. So I wanted um, to make that point. The second point, Henry, you mentioned a bit about China's accession to the WTO. Um, I am a firm believer that that was the right decision for the United States at that time to be an, a supporter of WTO accession. And when I look at um, the important legal and regulatory changes that China made at that time, how it opened and reformed its economy, um, how it became, as you mentioned, kind of glo a global trade force, and it's brought benefits to the international trading environment. I don't disagree with any of that, but I also think now when we, you know, here we are in 2021, changes need to be made, updates need to be made if indeed this system can be credible and can continue to function um, as you know, a major force in, in, in the WTO rule making process. Um, when China joined the WTO, I don't think there was any expectation that, the w, that there wouldn't be updates to the WTO rules. In fact, there was a new round that was launched at that time under the leadership of Pascal and me. And I think the expectation was that rules would be updated, there'd be new market access commitments, we would, you know, continue to update the subsidies rules or introduce rules and state. And also, of course, uh, uh, you know, uh, what do you think about this athlete bodies thing? You know, we, we still haven't got that fixed. And, uh, and also, of course, uh, 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 I mean, just now, Randy mentioned about this pantom, you know, we, you know, for the COVID-19 to, to get really 
uh, uh, lifted, uh, uh, we published, uh, you know, China and the U.S. agreed that maybe uh, uh, painting can be, uh, can be uh, the, the, can, the, the intellectual property, probably we won't protect that uh, too much, could be one of the efforts to, to solve the issue. And of course, also, uh, I know that EU has proposed the carbon uh, 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 bordering, uh, uh, you know, issues uh, on those areas. So perhaps you could elaborate, including the, the comment that uh, uh, question we raised before. Pascal, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, let me touch on a few of these points uh, while generally uh, very much agreeing uh, with uh, the points which uh, Wendy has made. Uh, first, on this issue of China joining WTO, and this will come back uh, when the uh, 20th anniversary uh, would appear on the horizon. Uh, as you know, there is now a narrative in the West uh, that uh, accepting China and the WTO was a mistake, and that uh, those who did that, and I rank among them, uh, were stupid enough to be cheated by China. Uh, this is absolutely wrong. Uh, you yourself, Henry, uh, said, and I totally agree with that, that you just have to look at the numbers. Uh, when China joined WTO, its external trade surplus was around 10% of GNP. It's now around zero, maybe 1%. Now, how do you move from 10% of your GNP external surplus to uh, zero or 1%? <laughs> There's only one way to do that, which is uh, to uh, import more than you export. And this is what has happened. And this is the answer. China's joint WTO was a big contribution to the world economy. So number-wise, it has worked. That's not the problem. That's not the point. Where there is a problem, which I think uh, we have to recognize looking back 20 years ago when uh, this deal was done, is that the assumption at the time, and I remember uh, my uh, conversations for closing the deal uh, between China and the European Union uh, with uh, Premier Tsu uh, who I think is no secret was a reformist, this is that as time would go, long term, China would converge with the dominant global market liberal system. And this is what did not happen. Or more precisely, it happened roughly during the first 10 years of China joining WTO. And then uh, in the next 10 years, which are uh, the ones uh, of the last decade, China diverge from this convergence road, uh, which uh, has started uh, with uh, Deng Xiaoping deciding China would rejoin the world economy. And this is where we have a problem. I think uh, the real problem with WTO versus China or China versus WTO is that China professes an exceptionalism as compared to global market capitalism, which then creates issues in terms of competition. This is why, this is why we need better, more precise rules on what we Europeans call state aid. And we Europeans know this problem. When the common market was created in the 1950s, part of our economies were still more nationalized than others. And the deal that was done at the time, notably between Germany and France, France had 30% of its economy nationalized. Germany had 5%. And Germany said, OK, I'm OK to open trade with France, but provided we have a system that regulates state aid with a specific body, which was the European Commission, in charge of controlling whether state aids are or not an unfair competitive advantage. So that's where we have an issue. It's not about joining. It's about the fact that 20 years after China joining, China is more of an exception 
vis-à-vis -vis the rest of the world than it was at the time. As far as uh, the issue of leadership is concerned, which you mentioned, Henry, uh, I totally agree that there is a leadership issue, uh, but that the, the solution to this leadership issue lies in changing a principle, which is that WTO is member driven. Member driven is a reason for poor leadership. Now, not that it should not be member driven at all. What in my view should happen is what happens in other normal international organizations is a better balance between the authority of the members and the authority of the DG and the secretariat. This member driven should be changed to co-driving the organization, members on the one side, they decide, not the DG, not the secretariat, but the DG and the secretariat must be able, must be given the authority to table proposals, to identify issues, to look into options like any other international organization. This rebalancing is something which is necessary. And I think the WTO would be much more efficient if it was recognized that this member driven is partially, partially transformed into a DG driving. Again, the legislator will remain the member states at the end of the day. On uh, issues uh, looking forward, I agree with what uh, Wendy said about the digital, of course, uh, with what she said about fishery subsidies. It's only now a question of uh, what are the exceptions in the name that artisanal uh, poor fishermen uh, should not be submitted to these rules. And the question is, what's the border between artisanal and coastal fishing for poor fishermen and big fish, big tuna in the Pacific, big China, <laughs> big Korea, uh, big Japan. And this is an issue that still needs to be solved. Uh, I see environment as a major issue coming. In so far as uh, I mean, climate change is now the number one issue of the international agenda globally. Uh, this uh, necessitates urgent, bold action that has to translate into uh, implicit or explicit uh, carbon price rise. Uh, and this, as long as there will not be a sort of global agreement on a global implicit or explicit carbon price around 100 or 120 euros, which is what economists tell us would be the right price for internalizing uh, the uh, negative effects of production systems in CO2 emissions, there will be different ways to address this problem, depending on countries, constituencies, hence a necessity to adjust these different systems. This is what you mentioned, Henry, why the European Union has now embarked on the CBAM, uh, which is not a, a new orchestra instrument, contrary to what it sounds, uh, but uh, carbon border adjustment mechanism in order to avoid that a very high price of carbon in the European Union. I think yesterday the price was 52 uh, euros a ton, uh, which is from far the highest price as compared to uh, US, uh, China, or elsewhere, that this very high price does not lead to carbon leakage, i.e. EU producers moving their production out of the European Union in order to benefit from a lower uh, carbon price. So this is a major issue. And I have proposed in a series of briefs, which I have co-authored uh, with the boss of Yes. That will allow countries having different views on how to increase carbon price, whether it's through tax, whether it's through permit uh, emission exchanges, whether it's about regulations to compare the way they progress in order to smooth 
the inevitable trade friction that differentiated carbon pricing in different countries uh, will be. I agree uh, with what Mandy said. Uh, my own view for what it's worth is that there are already sanitary exceptions in the TRIPS agreement that provide uh, for compulsory licensing in case of health emergency. We have a clear case of health emergency. What needs to be done is to make sure that the existing compulsory licensing systems work, whereas some view that it doesn't work quick enough. I think it's not a question of overhauling the trips agreement. It's a question of looking at how these exceptions, which are already provided, they are already waivered to intellectual property in the trips agreement in case of health emergency. The question is, do these processes, as they are structured in the trips agreement, allow for quick implementation of these compulsory licenses, whether for domestic production or whether for imports. And finally, uh, on your uh, question about uh, the appellate body, uh, Henry, uh, there is a structural problem and there is a more easy to fix problem. The structural problem takes us back to the issue of whether WTO is able to adjust, to reform, and to adopt new updated rules. As long as the rules remain what they were in the 90s, you have a growing gap between reality and old rules, and inevitably, in a dispute settlement system, it belongs to the judge to adjust to this reality. Old rules and new realities can only be reconciled within a dispute settlement system by judges interpreting old rules so that they can match new realities. So the real solution to fix the problem of whether or not the dispute settlement engages in judicial activism is to restart, reboot, rework uh, the rules making system so that the gap between reality and rules is narrowed, this will leave much less room to judicial activism or pretended judicial activism. On this, this second part of the problem is probably not that difficult to fix. Uh, I believe uh, the US are not always wrong uh, when they say that sometimes some rules of WTO were interpreted in a way uh, that can be criticized. I mean, if the US would say that about cases they won, it would be more convincing uh, than the US saying this only when, case, when they lost cases. Uh, if you only criticize the judge when you lose cases and never when you win, there's something there uh, which is a bit strange. But let's leave that aside. There are, in my view, many ways to fix these problems if the willingness of the US is to rejoin uh, the dispute settlement system. Uh, there are many ways to address these problems. And by the way, the US are not the only country that believes that from time to time, uh, the judges uh, may err in uh, interpreting uh, WTO rules. And this takes me to my final point, which I believe the three of us, uh, uh, Wendy, you and me can agree, which is that in order to fix this problem, of course, working closely between US, China, and EU is the key. Uh, there's, I mean, the European Union, uh, to the difference of uh, China and US, is not a full fledged sovereign, as we all know. But sovereignty uh, about the European Union uh, depends on which topic you consider. But trade is one. Trade is an area where EU has authority, has sovereignty, has size, as well as US and China. And I think this inevitably should lead uh, to fixing a number of these problems within this sort of G3. Not that they should decide for others, but if there is a consensus uh, between US, China, and Europe, I would be very surprised if this would not transform quite too into a WTO consensus. Over to you.
thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Pascal, for your uh, very uh, uh, st stimulating and but also forward-looking uh, comments and, and re recommendations. Yeah, I, I think that uh, I first want to thank both uh, Wendy and Pascal for for praise China joined WTO and also think that is the right decision. It's not only for China but also for the world. I think we we have a consensus for that. I mean, that is really great. And but also I. I think that Wendy uh, has mentioned that the China, uh, U.S. China, uh, China EU China, uh, uh, you know, trade forum, which I think that Pascal even took that further. Let's have a China EU <laughs> U.S. summit on trade would be really great. I, I think that is really uh, the most uh, uh, you know strong uh, three strongest uh, trading uh, blocks that really can talk to each other. And if they agree uh, among themselves, I'm sure we'll have an enormous uh, uh, impact on WTO, and, and that is really uh, uh, very, very good. I, I just want to maybe clarify one thing. I think, you know, Pascal, you mentioned about that, uh, you know, 20 years ago when China joined WTO, a lot of people think, oh, China, you know, someday going to become one of us, you're going to converge, you're going you're to be a Western democracy and things like that. But you see, you know, China has a 5,000 years history and it has its own logic, has its own development, uh, uh, you know, rhythm and uh, I, 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 you know, DNI. And <laughs> so, so but, but just like Deng Xiaoping said, it doesn't matter as a white cat, black cat, and as long as catches mice. And so if China has now really uh, got 1.4 billion people uh, really uh, in kind of uh, improved livelihood, as, as you said, you know, in, at that time, the per capita was 1,000, and now it's 10,000. That's enormous uh, uh, lifting uh, to the to the world. So, so I think maybe we we'll have to look at this uh, uh, coexistence. Uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe find a way to work with each other. I, I really uh, highly uh, uh, agree with both of you that maybe uh, EU, uh, US, and China should have uh, uh, trilateral talks on the trade and including you know for the WTO, uh, and then that will make things much easier. And that is something we need. Uh, particularly during the COVID time, we need a we need a high level dialogue. We need the particularly uh, those areas that is uh, uh, such a vital to the world global economy. I think both uh, EU, US, and China can contribute significantly to the st stability and prosperity of the world. So I, I think that is really a, a great idea, uh, out of, you know, out of our, our discussion tonight. And let's have a G3 summit. I mean, that's really great. Uh, now, I, I'd like to uh, continue with uh, uh, Wendy, if I may. Uh, I, mean, I know that you are the chief negotiator of, of TPP for many years. Uh, you have really put the TPP in, into, uh, concluded the uh, uh, TPP uh, 12 one, 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 you know, a number of years back uh, before Trump pulling out of that. But there is a, there's a, there's a, there's a theory that uh, somewhere uh, prevailing before then. So the TPP was designed by the U.S., uh, to contain China and uh, or maybe uh, pivotal uh, to Asia and things like that. Uh, uh, but you are the person that uh, uh, negotiated the TPP and uh, and now China is interested in the TPP and uh, now it's called the CPTPP. And then not only China, but the UK uh, and the Korea and many other more countries are, are wanting to join now. So, so what's your think about uh, the TPP and also uh, also, in largely those regionalization, you know, we have RCEP, we have a TBP, you know, we have other uh, FTA uh, among the regions. What, what that going to impact uh, WTO, for example? So, uh, uh, so maybe uh, you could talk about, uh, uh, share your view on that as well, Randy, please. Well, sure. And I would just say, you know, in terms of all of these regional trade agreements or bilateral trade agreements, if the WTO was really actively engaged in rulemaking and delivering successful outcomes to on important negotiating topics, I think the appetite for regional and bilateral trade agreements wouldn't be as high as it is now. And so the two are interrelated. I mean, the theory is that if you do bilateral free trade agreements and regional free trade agreements, that those should provide momentum and kind of push the WTO um, in the direction to do more. Um, and that should contribute to liberalization. Um, I think maybe it's not playing out that way, but in like in my mind, if within the next year at this ministerial, if the WTO isn't successful 
in delivering some meaningful outcomes and getting itself back on the map that you're going to see more and more of trade move toward, you know, to regional and bilateral trade agreements. Now, with respect to TPP, all I can say is that when I worked on it, um, I would have never predicted we would be in the situation where we are now, where the U.S. is out of TPP, Japan led the other countries to conclude TPP, and now China seems to be more interested in joining CPTPP than the United States. So sometimes my head spins when I think about all of this, but um, I also think that the story is not over either. Now, you know, it's interesting um, with respect to TPP in the United States, the debate has not um, gone away, okay? In fact, um, some prominent senators um, and other congressmen, um, you know, some noted foreign policy types in the administration and others, they've been pretty vocal about seeing the merits of a TPP-like approach and kind of questioning the Trump decisions, the, the, the Trump decision to for the US to exit the TPP. So the debate continues. And if you carefully look at statements from the administration with, re, with respect to TPP, um, they're almost endorsing the approach of working with like-minded countries to set rules, standards, and norms while also distancing themselves from the actual contents of, of what was in the TPP. So I don't think the debate's over in the United States, but I'm also pragmatic and I'm a realist. And I just don't see a scenario in the near term where the Biden administration, given all that's on its plate and given the domestic tox um, toxic nature of TPP, that it, you know, it announces one day we're going to rejoin. I kind of don't see that happening in the near term. I think what's more likely is that the United States works with other like-minded countries in the region to conclude a narrower sectoral type of deal, perhaps in the digital trade area, and perhaps that could build momentum for the United States to, um, you know, add um, to, to participate in other negotiations in the region. But I'm a firm believer, the United States, we need to get back in the trade space in the region, helping to shape the rules, the norms, and the standards. It's happening without us. Um, we're not benefiting from it. Um, I think in the United States, when Trump left TPP, I think the feeling was that TPP then you know, would, would die a quiet death, and also that RCEP would not proceed. And you know, clearly the opposites happen. CPTPP is in effect. The UK now is formally in accession negotiations. And RCEP, um, I think, will come into effect early 2022. And I think that's going to have a real impact on trade and supply chain and economic integration in the region. So it's time for the United States to get back into the trade game in the Asia Pacific region. Um, but this doesn't preclude our ability also to engage and lead in the WTO. Um, I, you know, again, the Biden administration has a lot on its plate, particularly with respect to COVID, economic recovery, infrastructure, competitiveness. Um, but um, if we lose the opportunity to engage on trade in the region, um, it's something I think we might look back on as being a major mistake and something that when we're ready to come back, it will be such a different Asia and our ability to be a real player and to influence the rules, norms, and standards will be minimized. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Wendy, yeah, for, your, for your comment on that. And uh, yeah, I, I agree that uh, U.S. needs to be back on that. More on all those uh, uh, regional trade, even uh, digital, it's better than, uh, than not coming back. So, uh, 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 Pascal, I mean, uh, you you are you are you used to be the European <laughs> Commissioner for Trade as well. I mean, you know that uh, recently China and EU, I mean, last year at the end of last year, China and EU have signed this uh, uh, comprehensive investment uh, treaty between the uh, the, the two parties, uh, and somehow you know that this has been. Uh, slow down again, but 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 actually the European business is still very bullish in China. We uh, we we have seen the numbers, surveys coming from EU Chamber of Commerce. 
We see actually European investment in China is increasing. We see that uh, all the you know auto sector or maybe pharmaceutical sector or medium even uh, in uh, aerospace, you know, they do more business in China than their own countries now. So, uh, so what do you see the prospect of a China EU business? I mean, uh, 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 you know, that is really great. Also, another question I want to pose to you is: the, you are the uh, president of Paris Peace Forum, and the Paris Peace Forum is really a great uh, a multilateral global governance uh, uh, platform. And uh, now you have been spending a lot of efforts on that. But I see you actually leading a lot of discussion with uh, WTO uh, Direct General, WHO Direct General, you know, quite a few rounds on that already. So uh, so what do you think about the uh, Paris Peace Forum can, uh, can promote the future globalization, uh, 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 you know, uh, in the, those areas? Pascal, please. Uh, I'll answer these questions. Let me come back uh, one minute to the point you made about uh, China uh, as a different system. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and to say that I agree with that. Uh, I agree that those who thought 20 years ago that China would converge with the dominant system in the world, at least economically, they see aside the political regime, uh, were not right. So the name of the game is not about convergence anymore. It's about coexistence. This is what we have to do. We have to better organize the coexistence of a specific China with the rest of the system. It's not about regime change. It's not about the rest of the world telling China change your doctrine, shrink your state-owned sector because a state-owned sector is not good for China, which personally I believe, but that's for the Chinese to decide. So whatever decision the Chinese leadership and people take on how they organize their economy, this is their business. But, but, once the Chinese sovereignly decide they want to have 30% of their economy under state control because these companies have to be supported by the state, then you need to accept that others do not proceed the same way and that there has to be disciplines on state aid. So again, it's not about telling China how it should run this business. Once China decides it has a massive part of its economy under party and state control, this is a competitive disadvantage for others, which needs to be fixed. So it's not a political issue. It's an issue of you run your economy the way you want to run it, but this should not put the others at a comparative disadvantage, hence the importance of this competitive neutrality, whether on the Chinese domestic market or when uh, we uh, others uh, compete uh, with uh, Chinese uh, businesses in international uh, markets. Uh, on, on, the, on TPP, I, I very much agree that the TPP is the best in class for the moment. If you look at what is the most modern way to address both what I called protectionism and precautionism, including all these trade and environment, trade and health, trade and safety, trade and, and so on, the TPP is the best ben benchmark on the market. The paradox being that it, it's a creation of the US. Uh, the whole software of the Trans-Pacific Partnership is a US software that coincides with the way the US see the world, with the way the EU see manufacturing, services, intellectual property. It's incredibly US-minded. And Australia and New Zealand and Japan and others have accepted that. And the paradox is that this incredibly US-minded, very good agreement, the US are not part of it. That's a sort of, you know, sort of mystery of history, uh, which, uh, which historians will probably comment 
50 or 60 years from now, the, 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 I think that the way forward is probably uh, that uh, you should do with TPP uh, what we are doing with WTO, i.e. move away from the single undertaking and accept that TPP is with bits and pieces and that some of these bits and pieces can be joined either by the US or by China or by UK, uh, why not? Uh, and I think this is the pragmatic way to go. But it remains that it is a, a, a lead agreement, especially by the way, if you compare it to RCP. RCP is very much a sort of old style agreement that deals mostly with uh, manufacturers, uh, uh, tariffs uh, and uh, and quantitative restriction. It's a much, it's a much, I mean, it's a large agreement and hence its importance, but it's much shallower in terms of discipline on how you run the, your economy in order to benefit from open trade uh, than, uh, than the TPP. Uh, as far as the EU-China investment agreement, uh, I remember, uh, what was signed at the end of last year between US and China was not a trade agreement. It was an investment agreement uh, that basically uh, allowed the EU to catch up on what the US had gotten from China in terms of uh, openness for investing in China. Uh, you're absolutely right. For the moment, this will not be ratified by the European Parliament uh, because of uh, sanctions and retaliations on sanctions about uh, Uyghurs, uh, Hong Kong, uh, and so on. Uh, again, on this, let's be pragmatic. Nothing prevents both China and the EU to effectively implement this agreement without this agreement being ratified. Huh? If we are serious <laughs> about, about the fact that there are benefits on both sides, it will not be ratified, so it will not be legally binding as a treaty should be legally binding, but nothing prevents both sides to move in reality towards uh, the content of this, uh, of this uh, agreement. Uh, and this, I, I think, uh, this is, I think, the way to go. On your last question about the Paris Peace Forum, Henry, uh, the Paris Peace Forum, of course, is not a, a trade forum uh, and it's probably uh, not fit to be a trade forum uh, because, I mean, the Paris Peace Forum is about getting things done. It's about getting projects done. It's about moving uh, global cooperation into new areas by new stakeholders, uh, whereas a multilateral, multilateral trading system is still something that has to do a lot with regulation. And the Paris Peace Forum is about cooperation between non-state, non-state-driven, non-sovereign partners like NGOs, like big businesses, like big academic institutions, like big cities, uh, whereas uh, trade is still regulated by sovereigns. So this is not where uh, we have, uh, as a Paris Peace Forum, a big uh, comparative advantage. But, but what we can do is mix like what we do in order to try and address this uh, looming, if not already there, uh, vaccine apartheid uh, between North and South on this planet, which I personally believe is a, a dramatic development that will slow the exit of this uh, economic crisis uh, stemming from a sanitary crisis uh, for one or two more years, uh, which I believe uh, is a dramatic development. And what we are trying together, as you said, uh, Henry, uh, with uh, the World Bank, uh, with the IMF, who's taking a leading role in trying to address this issue of a better North-South production and distribution of vaccines, including, of course, with WTO and WHO. This sort of uh, four uh, people, uh, David Malpass, uh, uh, and Kristalina Georgieva, Ngozi, and uh, Dr. Ted Ross, are the ones we are trying within the Paris Peace Forum 
to push to cooperate, including in trying to get from the next G20 commitments about more production and more distribution of existing non-use vaccines, which I believe is really, really, really a major issue, which we have to address extremely rapidly, short of which I believe a source of new north-south fracture uh, will divide this world, and we will see the consequences of that in major negotiations, like the one uh, who are uh, being prepared for Glasgow on climate change, for instance. So I think this is a big, big, big problem. Not that our trade issues are not important, but for the moment, there is something more important, uh, which is this vaccine production and distribution, which is a major economic issue. Over to you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Pascal. Yes, great. I really congratulate you on on the leadership of the Paris Peace Forum, which uh, uh, you have uh, you have such a great rally power, and uh, of course with uh, WHO, WTO, and uh, uh, World Bank, IMF, uh, you already quite had quite a few webinar uh, I, I attended. But I think maybe you could add AIB in the future to 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 other infrastructure part of that, because infrastructure would be a new area uh, that I see President Biden is paying a lot of attention, EU is paying attention, China is really also doing a lot of work. So so that could be one of the things. Uh, I don't know if a WTO or maybe other, you know, World Bank can, uh, AIB can work together. Uh, but 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 I, I agree with you that uh, you know the uh, the uh, the uh, the TPP. I mean, I'm I'm quite uh, pleased to see both uh, Wendy and the Pasca has has actually have a high credit for TPP as as a higher standards of uh, of the future uh, trade. Uh, 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 you know, upper trade, high standard trade for the for the for the global trade in future, and maybe set a good example for the WTO reform. So, so even we put part of uh, a piece of that, you know, that'd be great. So, I'm glad that the CCG also been promoting uh, China joint uh, TPP because we. I feel that maybe it's a, like a mini WTO we can join, you know, because uh, since China joined WTO, China abolished the thousands or tens thousands of uh, outdated rules and regulation that made China. You know, going forward, so we need some uh, new uh, uh, target to, to to hope to 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 aim for, so that <laughs> uh, I mean, TPP could be a good uh, uh, high standard uh, uh, for 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 our reform as well. Uh, now, I, I won't have a, a, a you know a last round of my talk. I will have a, we collect some uh, questions from our experts and uh, uh, media as well. But before we do that, I would like to uh, pose another question to to Wendy: is that on the Sino-U.S. <laughs> trade relation? Yeah, but of course, you, you've you been waiting this. Uh, we, we, we've been also talking in the, in the 2018, 2019 when on the hike of uh, US China trade war going on. And and then, of course, uh, 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 President Trump has in, in, uh, put uh, such a, a large uh, tariff on China. I mean, still uh, 300 some billion uh, there, uh, uh, not lifted. So, 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 what do you think about uh, uh, the phase one and then the phase two or? Uh, or or is there a near future that uh, we can really uh, get our talks to uh, to lift those uh, uh, trade uh, 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 you know sanctions? Because I see uh, the USTR, uh, Catherine Tai has made a phone call with uh, Vice Premier Liu He and the Minister of Trade also has a, uh, uh, our Commerce has a, a, tr a phone call as well. Uh, so what do you think about the, uh, I see there's an Alaska meeting between the top diplomats, uh, the Tianjin meeting last week between diplomats. What about uh, uh, we have a trade minister meeting or, or commerce minister meeting or US Taiwan meeting to, to solve these uh, trade sanction issues <laughs> that, uh, as you also mentioned, particularly on the, on the medical, some urgent uh, supply issues. We shouldn't leave uh, levy tax on both sides. We, we should really uh, support on that and maybe uh, you know have some uh, new uh, uh, incentive for the W2 minister meetings for that. What, what, what do you think? And what are your comments about sign and US trade relations? Randy, please. I think that could be subject to its own webinar, but just a few thoughts here. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting during the Trump administration, I think US China trade friction kind of, you know, was front and center in our overall relationship. And in the Biden administration, it's trade is part of a whole host of issues that are being reviewed internally. So the Biden administration is still undertaking its review. 
we don't know where they're going to come out on tariffs and sanctions and um, phase one agreement and the phase two issues. So we'll have to see how that um, transpires. My personal view, though, is we should find a way to, again, maybe with respect to tariffs, to find some baby steps we could take, meaning just as you mentioned, I think the United States now we have over $300 billion worth of tariffs in place against Chinese imports. China has $110 billion worth of tariffs um, imposed um, on US imports. So I think there is room for kind of small steps to be taken. And then we can see, does that work? And maybe then build on it over time. But I think we need to be realistic and pragmatic. Both sides have their own domestic audiences that we're responding to. This would happen, you know, let's be honest, in a in a, you know, not in a vacuum, but in the context of just broader US Sino frictions and tensions. Um, so, you know, so that would be number one on the tariffs. Um, with respect to phase one implementation, um, my personal view is under the circumstances, China's doing a pretty good job in implementing the rules part of the, of the agreement. When it comes to purchases, yeah, they're falling short, but with respect to agriculture purchases, they're probably doing, you know, Beijing's doing the best in meeting those targets. Those detailed targets will expire at the end of this year, but the agreement itself stays in place until either side notifies the other it wants to exit. Um, but what will be critical is when we look at these so-called phase two issues, which were never addressed, the phase two negotiations never started. I think the question is how best to address those issues. And uh, some of them, particularly the issue of subsidies um, and related kind of non-market economy practices, I think the best venue if the WTO really worked well to address these would be the WTO. We're not going to um, you know, address these issues, in my view, bilaterally in, in a, in a successfully, and it'd be important to bring in other countries. So I would hope that China would be positive about addressing these issues in negotiations in the WTO. If the Chinese delegations in, in Geneva continue to refuse to open the door to negotiations in these areas, the US and other countries are gonna have no choice then but to look at alternatives. And the alternatives I think will be what I would call defensive measures, um, strengthening their own toolbox. We've already seen the EU do this um, recently on subsidies and competition policy. There's legislation in the United States to strengthen and expand our countervailing duty legislation. And so I think that is going to be the response if the WTO can't move forward and tackle some of these difficult issues. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. I, I think that uh, that's something I think uh, we, we all need to, to talk and I'm glad to see that uh, uh, the, the phase one probably went uh, relatively well and also that uh, I totally agree with you. We should uh, start uh, lifting some of those tariffs imposed on each other and then we can really move from there and maybe even remove most of it uh, or even completely. So so we need to talk, we need to start somewhere, uh, absolutely. Uh, now, Pascal, I mean, you are, you are, you, are in, you know, in the EU, you're in the, in the center, you're in Paris, uh, you, you you have been in all those issues. I noticed that OECD, I mean, lately uh, proposed there's a global uh, a corporate minimum tax, and then that has actually proposed by G7, and then proposed by G20, and then 130 countries. Uh, goes along with it. Uh, in principle, China is uh, is agreed to, to 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 on that, and so that that is one issue. And also about this digital tax. I mean, used to uh, the EU used to to uh, you know asking for those big tech companies. So what about those issues? I don't know if you're still uh, uh, on top of those issues. Maybe <laughs> you can share on that of the EU perspective on, on that as well. Uh, you know, I think uh, I mean these are uh, the the area of uh, global taxation for multinational companies is one of the very rare good news we've had for the last years in terms of international cooperation, which <coughs> generally speaking has been uh, uh, pretty uh, immobile 
uh, there are very, very few issues where we can see progress in international cooperation. This is one, and we owe it mostly uh, to the Biden administration. Uh, these issues about avoiding multinational corporations to practice what uh, diplomats kindly uh, define as excessive tax harmonization, and I love this way they have of uh, calling this excessive tax optimization. I think this is an area where we've had progress. We owe it mostly to the Biden administration, and this is good news. And it simply stems from the fact that the importance and the growth of these multinational companies, including in the digital sector, where they are making hundreds and hundreds of billions of profit without paying taxes is something that has become unsustainable for political reasons everywhere. But to be frank, Henry, this is an exception. And we need much more than that, especially in moving, trying to move out of this uh, COVID crisis. Uh, we need much more than that uh, to re-dynamize uh, international cooperation. I think the G20 is the available space to do that, not that it is a full-fledged institution, not that the G20 members have the legitimacy to speak for the rest of the world, but this is, this is the place where I think we should uh, focus our minds, including, by the way, including, and on this I very much agree to translate into general terms what Wendy has just said about fixing uh, the US-China uh, uh, trade uh, frictions and tariffs, I think the most urgent thing is to try and divide for the next Italian G20, apart from what I've said on vaccines, a few low-hanging food that would not be too difficult to address and that would signal a relaunch of international negotiations and cooperation on trade. I think what we need for the moment is to defreeze this US-China uh, EU uh, triangle in order to move things forward. And I agree with Wendy that the most obvious area to do that, which is not a major trade problem, but which has become a symbol of whether the WTO can decide and move forward in these fishery subsidies, uh, which is uh, a low hanging, if not fruit, uh, fish, at least fruit, uh, which uh, I think we really should focus on. And on this, we, to be frank, we need China to engage. China, fishing wise, is not anymore a developing country. I know that for reasons in principle, China will not recognize this. And this is not about China recognizing a big principle. It's about China accepting to join a system of disciplines, which I think is really needed to preserve uh, the fish resources for the future. And it's as much an environment as a trade problem. So if China still has trade problems with the West, Please, China, look at this with environmental glasses. Okay, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Pascal. I think uh, 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 I, I think that uh, you talk about China as a developing country. China actually, you know, the per capita wise, still uh, uh, pretty uh, relatively low compared with uh, all the developing countries, uh, all the developed countries. But as a matter of fact, China, uh, even though they are, uh, you know, because they are in line with many developing countries. They didn't really enjoy the development country benefit in terms of a WTO. So, so they have got, foregone a lot of that benefit already. So, so I think that is a, uh, something that maybe uh, term-wise, you know, we can, we can think about that, but, but I don't think uh, it was really a substantive issue there probably. But anyway, we, we, are, we are coming to the final uh, uh, online question part. We, we're going to conclude probably uh, soon. But as my, my staff told me, we have about almost 400,000 viewers watching us online and uh, those in China and outside. And uh, so, so you're really uh, getting a lot of attention. I, I have some online question uh, collected. Uh, actually, I have a question from 
uh, Professor uh, Tu Xinquan. He is a CCG non-resident senior fellow, and he's the dean and professor of China Institute for WD Studies at the University of International Business and Economics. Uh, he has a question. He said, uh, uh, we expect the Biden administration, which pays more attention to the multilateral system, would support the restoration of the operation of the WTO appellate body. However, a little difference has been seen in the attitudes of the Biden administration compared with the Trump era. Uh, is uh, the US going to completely abolish the appellate body or is it using as a leverage to obtain specific policy objectives such as more free use of anti-dumping and contributing rules? Uh, so, uh, so, so he has another question related with the fishery discussions. He said, hopes are high on negotiating on the fishery subjects at the 12th WTO Ministerial Conference. But that said, the US recently proposed to add the issue of forced labor in the negotiations. Does this signal the US intention of uh, uh, making more difficult uh, of the success negotiation or use it as a, a concession uh, to obtain concession from other countries? <laughs> so that's from uh, uh, a professor too. Uh, but, but, but I also have some uh, uh, question from the media, uh, like from, uh, from the China Daily. Uh, what is the biggest challenge for international trade in the context of COVID-19? Uh, how should we uh, you know, tackle that? And also uh, from uh, CPPCC Daily, China's political consultative conference daily. Uh, recently, the executive meeting of the State Council of China has decided to further deepen the reform of the cross-border trade facilitation and improve the business environment at ports. Those measures mainly included 27 specific content in the five aspect. Uh, so would this be a positive uh, signs of China actually moving forward to, uh, uh, to the multilateral system? Uh, one thing has been highlighted that is uh, we need to optimize the authorized, authorized economic operator system and provide more facilitation measures to for authorized enterprise. How, how to evaluate this, what this means to further strengthen hand. Uh, anyway, maybe this is too, too concrete uh, question, but then the, the, there's another one from South China Morning Post. Uh, I think similar to what uh, Professor Tu was saying. The fishery subsidy issue is currently the sole active area of the multilateral negotiation at the WTO. How possible do you expect that a WTO fishery pact can be reached by the end of the year? What are the stumbling blocks and how to deal with them? Whether the US-China tension remains a key factor for the talks. So, so I think we probably uh, you know, have, have last few questions uh, for you to, 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 to see uh, if we are want to address any of them, and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll conclude after that. So maybe, uh, Wendy, you want to go first? Sure, <laughs> so a lot of questions. So let me um, respond to a few. First, with respect to the appellate body, um, I think you need to give the administration more time here. Um, they're clearly reviewing um, um, you know, the issues related to um, dispute settlement in the WTO. Um, I would also note that the appellate body issue was an issue of concern even before President Trump took office. And I would just echo what Pascal Ami said a little while ago, that this is not just a US concern, but other countries are concerned with the operation and the overreach of the appellate body. So um, I think we need to give the administration more time. My hope is that with time, they will put concrete ideas on the table on how their concerns can be addressed as opposed to what officials in the Trump administration did was just to kind of sit on the, on the sidelines and kind of complain about the system. So again, let's give it more time. With respect to trade and COVID, one issue we have not covered, and I just wanna put it on the table, is the whole issue of export restrictions really needs to be looked at. The WTO rightly allows for export restrictions to be imposed, um, but there are certain principles, including these measures should be temporary and they should be transparent. And if you look at um, the recent study coming out of St. Gallen Uni um, University, 
they, um, you know, closely catalog all the restrictions that are put on, on, on medical related goods, medicines, as well as food. And I think they noted like hundreds of measures now have been in place for over one year. So I think that is an area where more discussion and kind of more focus, more transparency should be put on to make sure once these restrictions are put in place, um, that they don't remain in place forever. Finally, on the fisheries negotiations, I'm hopeful that that will be a concrete outcome of the ministerial meeting in November. Um, but this is not a given. There is a lot of work still to be done. While a lot of progress has been made, there are still some potential stumbling blocks. And those include exceptions that developing countries, including China, want to take from the obligations. And so the WTO is in a summer break now. They'll have three months to continue negotiations in this area. And I'm hopeful, given the high stakes um, of reaching an agreement here, that parties will come together um, and find not just a solution, but a meaningful solution that really contributes to um, you know, what is a growing global problem. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, Pascal, please, your final uh, comment. Yeah, on, uh, on international trade and COVID-19, uh, as I said uh, previously, I don't think it's a major trade problem, nor do I believe that the solution to producing more vaccines and distributing them better is a trade issue, but for a limited aspect, which is uh, whether and how you can oil the compulsory licensing system that already provides waivers for intellectual property in case of health emergency. So it's not a major uh, uh, trade issue, but there is an issue there that needs to be considered. I do not agree that the main bottleneck to producing or distributing more vaccines lies there, although I believe that if there is a necessity to recourse more easily to the existing system of compulsory licensing, this should be looked at. On uh, measures uh, for trade facilitation in ports or otherwise, uh, I think uh, China is uh, right. Uh, there still remains, although we have a trade facilitation agreement since the end of 2013, and I remember that because it took us four years to cook it in the WTO at the time. Uh, whereas there are obvious huge potential for trade facilitation in digitalization of trade procedures, uh, imports, export certificates, import licensing, proof of origin, the digital uh, technology can help a lot. There still is, there still is a handicap for notably small businesses. And I think in doing what China does in uh, easing its uh, port handling uh, procedures, it's doing uh, exactly right. Uh, and finally, uh, on uh, fish subsidies, uh, I again totally agree with uh, Wendy. Uh, the answer to the question uh, which was raised, which is what stands on the way to an agreement, I think the simple answer is the following. We need stronger disciplines that prevent subsidies that lead to overfishing, but we need to preserve small artisanal coastal fishing operations. That's the key. Now, in, in simple words, we need disciplines for everybody, but for 
small fishing boats, artisanal, not industrial, coastal, not icy, small, not big boats. Now, how small is small remains to be negotiated. Uh, but I think uh, if there is a political willingness to do an agreement, how small is small is something which trade negotiators can fix rather easily. So that's my view. That's where the problem lies. And this is where, in my view, the solution lies. There is a solution in defining how small is small. Over to you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Pasma. I think we come almost come to the end of our uh, uh, webinar, a special webinar series uh, uh, for the seventh Center for China and Globalization Forum. I really appreciate uh, uh, this discussion tonight. I think it's very stimulating, very uh, uh, constructive, and also uh, uh, and also uh, uh, very uh, uh, you know full of a lot of ideas and uh, and suggestions. And also, I, uh, I think that uh, we have covered many issues, uh, WTO reform, uh, COVID-19, the, the future multilateralism, even concrete as, as a TPP, a fishery subway, and, uh, and Paris Peace Forum. Of course, we have so many issues. But I think this is really great. I mean, this is an open dialogue we have. Uh, it's really, uh, you know, a frank discussion. And also, it's very good to uh, stimulate more thoughts. I really appreciate that. Uh, we have come to some kind of consensus that maybe we should really lift some of those tariffs, even at the, from very minimum. But I'm very grateful that, of course, also we had this, uh, uh, that, uh, you know, we should have a China joint WTO is a, is a good thing. I mean, at least we have a consensus. Of course, uh, we, we still need to make progress. We need to uh, still to make reform, but China joined the WTO, not only good for China, but also for the world. I think that is a, a, another consensus we have. But also, finally, I, I really appreciate uh, all, all three of us mentioned about uh, uh, US, uh, EU, China, you know, we, let's have a trilateral a summit of some kind be on a train. I mean, honestly, that probably even on uh, COVID-19 fighting as well. It would be a really great idea to do that. Uh, I, I really uh, hope that we, we have offered uh, uh, policymakers some interesting uh, alternatives as well. So once again, I want to thank uh, uh, Ms. Wendy Cutler, uh, Vice President of Asia Society Policy Institute, uh, but also former acting uh, uh, USTR and uh, chief negotiator of TPP, and also to uh, Mr. Pascalami, the president of uh, uh, Paris Peace Forum, but also uh, the former uh, WTO <laughs> director general uh, for one of the longest serving uh, DJ, and, and also former European commissioner for trade as well. So, and also to our viewers, I mean, we have. <laughs> almost 400,000 viewers online, and that's a, a spectacular uh, across China and the rest of the world. So once again, thank you all very much, and we hope to see you again uh, sometime later. So thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.